WSDQ Dunlap, WEPG South Pittsburgh, The Copperhead, WSDT Saudi Daisy, Chattanooga. The viewpoints expressed on Liberty Works Radio Network are not necessarily those of the network, its affiliates, or sponsors. This is Liberty Works Radio Network. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. Good evening, this snowy evening. I hope everybody's careful out there. If that temperature drop could be slippery. This is Robin Frazier on Liberty Works Radio Network, Carol Confidential. And my colleague, uh, Commissioner Rothschild, is not with me today. Um, so I want to talk about a few things that have been on my mind. I really wanted to ask him some questions, and maybe I can... Um, at least uh, bring them up and tell you what I think is going on. But when Rich is with me again, he can give us the inside scoop on what the, the commissioners are doing. Um, and the and the couple of topics that I wanted to talk about are have to do with taxes, impact taxes, and homestead credit taxes. And these are uh, two areas. Of course, I was trying um, when I was in there to reduce any taxes that we could because. I think when the people have more money in their pockets, that they know best how to spend it and that there are a lot of roles the government has taken over that has no business being in. So there's plenty of places to cut and uh, get some more money back into um, private sector where the real wealth is created. And when, you know, small businesses and people are creating wealth, then the government gets certainly gets its fair share and can do the things that government ought to do. So I was always looking for places. And one of the um, areas that made a lot of sense, which would maybe help a little bit of building to be spurred, was to cut impact fees. The impact fees uh, are um, targeted to specific things. You can't just have an impact fee and then put it in a slush fund and use it for whatever you want. But in Carroll County, we had uh, an impact fee for parks and recreation, which we continue to have. And uh, to tell you the truth, I'm not sure exactly what that amount is, but it was a smaller amount comparatively. And then there was impact fees for building schools. And, of course, when uh, I came into office in 2010, uh, we had already seen a decline in enrollment of a couple thousand, maybe 3,000 students, and any building that occurred that would uh, bring new children into the school system, well, if we're down by 3,000 feet, then there's not going to be an impact. So uh, I propose that we eliminate the impact fee uh, until the time that you know, school enrollments were increasing. And we had quite the discussion. Uh, the, my colleagues really didn't want to eliminate that impact fee. Um, however, fortunately, um, Ted, uh, in uh, budget and management, Ted Zaleski uh, pointed out the fact that if you collect impact fees and you don't really have a project, you don't really have a school that you're building, you know, there hasn't really been an impact to the school system um, because of growth, then you have to give the money back. So that was enough to convince everybody, well, we better not be collecting. Uh, We've already collected impact fees to pay for everything that we can think of we can spend the money on. And so uh, we, I guess we better not. But however, instead of just eliminating the impact fee until such time as the board would come in and um, reinstate an impact fee, uh, they put it uh, on a two-year schedule where you would take another look at it. So <clears throat> I know while I was in there, each time it came up, we you know, voted to continue another two years with no impact fee for building schools. Since, again, enrollments continued to decline and really were in the mode of closing schools, not building schools. So growth is uh, the little bit of growth that we do have is um, has no impact on the schools. So uh, and to give you some sense um, in 
1998 when I was on the planning commission and we were bursting at the seams and we had to kind of slow it down so government could catch up with infrastructure. Um, I, I, the, the number of units that were being built were something over 1,200 because when I came in in 2002, they had put a moratorium in the board ahead, which I disagree with because, you know, anytime you, you, you cut it off, cut off the building, then, you know, it's building up. And when you finally open building back up, you have this huge spike. And that, that creates a bigger problem than if you just sort of try to manage uh, how much growth is happening, maybe slow it down a little bit until you catch up on the infrastructure. But anyway, we had this, they, they choked it off, and then they had a spike, and then they had to, you know, come back in and manage it. And we were we were kind of coming out of the um, uh, cutting everything off. And we were up to about 1,200 um, permits a year back in the early 2000s. Well, now it's about 200. And it was 200 uh, units when I came in uh, in 2010. So, you know, we're, it's 20, only 20% of the amount of growth occurring. So... We have low growth, we have student enrollments declining, and there certainly isn't any impact when a new family moves in. I heard that they are discussing um, reinstating the impact fee. Um, I believe that, again, there would be no impact. And if we collect monies when there's no project that, is a, is a true project because we have growth, then we're going to have to give that money back. Then you're going to have to have a bureaucracy to figure out how to give the money back. So I, I hope that they will um, listen and understand enough not to reinstate that impact fee. Because number one, you know, we're already having enough trouble, you know, getting any kind of growth occurring. So you don't want to add a tax. Anything you tax, you get less of. Uh, so we don't want to be adding a tax to, to, to building, especially one that has a specific purpose that you're not going to fill because it just ain't happening. <laughs> There's no impact to the school system uh, when we build a house and, and some kids go to school. So I'm, I wanted to ask Rich what the inside scoop was on that. You know, we're really, truly considering bringing that impact fee back. Now, perhaps... Um, they're looking at um, impact fee for some other service. I know you can do it for roads. It's a lot more complicated, and that's why um, the commissioners never took that on. Um, I'm not sure what else they could could use it for. I don't know if you can use it for public safety or not. But anyway, uh, I think the citizens ought to know if they're going to increase that impact fee, what exactly is it for and does it make any sense? Because if it's for schools, it doesn't make any sense uh, because there definitely is no impact as people move in. So that was one of the fees that I was successful in knocking out last time I was in, and I hope that will continue until the economy really turns around. And I, I personally am against impact fees, period. I think uh, the capital side of the budget is probably the easier side. Um it's when you create that ongoing operating side that you have to be careful. And that's why uh, when you, you know, have a lump sum of money sitting in an account that's, that's for cap, uh, some capital need, there's a tendency to want to build something. But when you build something, then you have to pay for the, you know, utilities, the insurance, the maintenance, and so forth. You create an, uh, an operating side to that capital expenditure. And um, I think that if there's a need for infrastructure, that if that should be part of what's in your budget as a commissioner. And uh, we talked about adequate public facilities uh, not too long ago, and that, that kind of gives you the red flag as a commissioner of what, how to prioritize your capital projects when there's a infrastructure that's showing as, you know, becoming inadequate, then you need to look at that closely to see is that a place where we need to begin to save money. If a 
if there's a school in, in some area that's becoming inadequate, um, then you need to take a look at that to see if there's a way to relieve that or if you're going to have to have a capital project. So um, hopefully we're not going to see any new impact fees because, again, we don't want to be increasing fees in an economy that really hasn't taken off yet. And, uh, you know, I know the government folks keep telling us things are getting better, but it's not what I see. <laughs> it's not what I hear from small businesses. So we'll, we'll get rich on that one time when he's in here with us. Um, the other one is the Homestead Tax Credit. And at one point, um, Commissioner Rothschild and I talked about that a lot because, again, as a, you know, I brought that up as a commissioner when I was in to say, you know, right now assessments are not increasing. But at some point in time, they're going to increase. And uh, Carroll County's uh, cap on how quickly your uh, taxes can go up is 5%. And this Homestead tax credit sounds like you're getting something. And so it's uh, it really should be more like it, it really should be an assessment cap is what we should call it. And, and that's what I call it, a homestead tax cap. Um, and I can tell you why they call it a credit, try to explain it for, to you. It's a little bit complicated, but not really. There are two things that will increase the taxes, your property taxes. One is the commissioner set a property tax rate. And that, again, was something that I was trying to lower by five cents. And I think we got up to three and a quarter cents. Um, that's one way your property tax increase. The other is the assessment, and the state does your property tax assessment. So they come and, uh, you know, figure out what the market value of your home is, supposedly, and uh, what it might be in uh, the next three years. That was a, a law that was passed uh, back when Ray Beck was in the, uh, in the legislature, and um, the state used to assess every year, and this law said to break the county down into three sections and do it in and do assessments every three years. So in Carroll County, your property is assessed every three years as we rotate through these three sections of the county. Um, I think it's the southern end of the county that's being assessed this year. So if your assessment goes up, even if the county keeps the same tax rate, then your taxes go up because your total amount that your the tax rate is being applied to has increased. And there is a law that says that the cap on how much an assessment can go up uh, in any given county is 10%. But as a county, you can decide whether it's 10%, 7%, 5%, 3%. You can make that decision. Carroll County at one point was at 10%, and they, they dropped down, I think, to 7 and then to 5%. But 5 is still a pretty good jump <laughs> in tax assessments, um, especially since properties are, are – so much uh, greater market value than they used to be. So I had proposed that we, while, you know, there was really not much movement in the market, that we go ahead and drop it to 3% so that uh, when assessments began to increase, um, it wouldn't hit property owners too hard. Now, why um, this is called a tax credit, why it says a homestead tax credit is because what they do at the state is if your home has increased in value, let's say by 10%, but there's a county cap of 5%, then instead of increasing your assessment by 10%, they only go up 5%, but they show the 10% and then give you a credit for the other five. I'll talk a little bit more about that when we come back. We're here at the end of uh, this first segment. But we'll talk again about Homestead Tax Credit. What, what does that mean? What's happening in Carroll County when you come back to Carroll Confidential in five minutes? We'll see you on Liberty Works Radio Network in five.
Welcome back to Liberty Works Radio Network. This is Carol Confidential. I'm Robin Frazier. I'm normally here with Commissioner Rothschild, and uh, we'll catch up with him on Thursday, I'm sure. Um, if you would like to call in, uh, ask anything, make a statement, sure we'd like to hear from you at 410-848-9191. Feel free to call. Uh, I was talking about a couple of uh, taxes that were um, ones that I was looking to reduce when I was a commissioner, and they are popping back up for review. We talked about the impact fees in the first segment and then began to talk about homestead tax credit. And I was uh, trying to explain uh, why it's called a credit, um, but why it's more understandable if you call it a cap. Um, I explained how the, the state does the assessments, and now laws have been passed. Uh, oh, gosh, that's probably been 25 years ago now <laughs> that we um, do assessments in thirds. So if the county split into thirds, and not everybody's assessment goes up at the same time, but you your assessment's done for a three-year period of time and only done every three years, and that by law the assessments could go up by 10%. If we had... You know, we just really experienced that in a big way um, in in the mid 2000s when uh, the market was going through the roof, um, mo- mainly because of supply and demand. When uh, the federal government put pressure to uh, do loans to people and not really uh, like calling them no doc loans, where uh, they weren't really checking their credit and they they or how much money they really made. And they were making loans to all kinds of people, and it, it just made a glut in the market because anyone could buy a house. And that drove up the um, market price of the house because we had uh, more people buying houses than we had housing supply. So we had this big glut and uh, drove up all the prices. And, of course, that crashed because people that don't make enough money can't afford uh, you know, their payments uh, that are above the amount they can afford. So <laughs> it was no surprise that there was going to be a crash. And um, so during that time, though, uh, assessments were, went up like 30 or 40 percent, which is huge. And um, there's something called the Homestead Tax Credit. And really what it is is a cap as to how quickly – your assessment can go up. So if it jumped up 20% and there's a cap of 10, then you would get a credit of 10%. They would show your assessment and what it really was, but then they would give you a credit to make up the difference between the 10% cap and the 20% increase. Uh, now, recently, uh, Carroll County was always kind of behind in making the change because it takes time to make a change. But they were at 10. They went down, I believe, to 7. And then to 5 during this time that the market was going crazy. So uh, not everybody really got the benefit of those reductions um, right away. Uh, and then what happens over time, because it, you're assessed every three years, is that your tax cap keeps you from climbing as quickly, but when the market begins to decline, like it, like we saw it do, I mean, we've never seen anything quite so traumatic, I don't think, but, um, you know, once it hit 40 or 45 percent more, then it began to come down, and it came down probably 20 percent. So as it was coming down, the assessments were declining, uh, and you were only allowed to go up every three years by a certain percentage, at some point those two lines cross, and then we're all even again. And so you stop getting a credit at the point that uh, you're not increasing more than whatever the cap is set. So uh, your your tax bill actually may have increased uh, when you thought you should be getting a credit because – the downward line of the assessment uh, came down to the point where it was increasing by uh, maybe uh, 5% instead of 10%, and therefore, uh, 
you know, you owed you owed some taxes. That that crisscross happened. And I remember people complaining, how in the world could I be owing, you know, greater taxes? But that's the point at which those two lines crossed. Anyway, we were all level by the time I was a commissioner, pretty much in 2010. And um I felt that we ought to take a look at that since it takes about a year and a half for it to uh, be implemented and go ahead and lower that cap before assessments began to climb again so that when they did, um, people would, wouldn't get the, the huge hit of a 5% increase in their, in their assessment, which would make their taxes go up. So, so I uh, propose that we lower it to three, um, we had lots of discussion. That's when, you know, it was Commissioner Howard, Shoemaker, Roush, Rothschild, and myself. Um, Rich and I were working to lower it, and uh, we couldn't get the other three to come down, not even to four, <laughs> from five to four, to try to make it easier uh, when assessments began to go up. Um, apparently, in our projections as to how much revenues would increase, uh, generally we would use a 3% increase and in some of those out years in order to make that budget balance, uh, there was a, a projection of a 5% increase. And of course, all of those numbers are just projections and they're not real. And, uh, However, if we reduced it to a 3% increase instead of a 5% increase, it might affect whether or not we were balanced in the out years. And uh, um, the, the other three would not go with protecting citizens in the future uh, because of this little slight difference it might make in our out years and our budget, which, you know, I could find I had several items that, where we could cut spending and make up that difference. But they didn't want to hear that. They didn't do it. And now um, assessments apparently are going up 4 or 5%. I find that actually hard to believe because I still think uh, the, the market's not good. It certainly isn't good here in Tawny Town. I just did a little review of uh, what's for sale. And over 50% of all the homes that are for sale on one of the, the sites called Zillow, which is a pretty popular one, um, are in foreclosure or pre-foreclosure. So that doesn't show a very strong market, and those foreclosures uh, usually bring the assessments down. I mean, if if the tax assessment office is honest, you know, when uh, 50% of the houses in your market are foreclosures, yes, they're going to be lower, maybe the market value because it's a foreclosure, but that affects the whole market. Somebody has a choice in a in a given neighborhood of two houses that are very similar to another and one is market value and the other two are foreclosures, they're going to buy the foreclosure <laughs> and that that is the true market. So anyway, according to Sue Krebs, assessments are going to go up 4 or 5% and uh, so the one-third of Carroll County that's going to get their reassessments is going to pop up and because we didn't make that uh that vote to lower the cap to 3%, well, the taxes are going to be a little bit higher in that area. Now, I don't know if the commissioners will take a look at that and try to try to catch that um, and make it a little more reasonable climb up as, as assessments go, but I, I doubt it. I doubt that the commissioners that are in there now are going to look for ways to, uh, to cut taxes. And then that's a shame because we could have made that a more gradual increase for people that are still struggling in this economy. And obviously, here in Tawny Town, they are, if over 50% of the homes that are for sale are foreclosures. Uh, so my apologies that I couldn't get that through. And uh, I don't know, maybe you should, if you have a commissioner, uh, you should push on them a little, ask them about that homestead tax credit, and if we can't get our cap down to 3% so it grows at a, at a lesser uh, um, rate than, than it will today because it's still at 5%. The other topic I wanted to take a look at today um, is one that I read about in the Northern News, and I found it quite interesting. And we uh, last time I talked, we talked a lot about the uh, 
school construction and what some of my ideas were for closing schools. But I find, found it interesting that this was uh, one of the Northern News uh, articles right on the front page. It says, this time Hogan rejects Guthrie. And of course, Guthrie is the superintendent of schools, Steve Guthrie. It says, Carroll County Public Schools Superintendent Stephen Guthrie went before the Bureau of Public Works. Now, in um, the Bureau of Public Works is made up of the comptroller of the state, the treasurer of the state, and the governor. And anytime there's a capital project uh, for schools, um, the school board and often the commissioners, if they are in agreement, and even the delegation will go before the Bureau uh, or the Board of Public Works to lobby for our monies <laughs> for the capital projects. So this is what was, was happening. Stephen Guthrie, a superintendent, uh, was going before this Bureau of Public Works, the comptroller, the treasurer, and the uh, governor. And that was on January 27th with a request for $3.4 million to complete the roof repairs on several county schools. His request for roof repair funding caused Governor Larry Hogan to nearly hit the ceiling after his December offer of $4 million to keep three county schools, including North Carroll High, open, and it was rejected by the superintendent. So um, the governor had offered $4 million. Um, uh, some of our delegates had requested it. Now, I don't agree with that. <laughs> I um, don't believe that we should pump in dollars to keep schools open um, when we have 5,000 empty seats and enrollments are going to continue to decline uh, up to maybe 8,000. And um, I think that's like flushing money down the toilet. However, the governor was offering that money to delay the decision um, because apparently the um, state has some opinions about what schools should be closed or maybe has heard enough of an uproar that they want to make sure that Carroll County is going about it in the right way, and they're spending monies in the in the proper way. I don't know what roof projects these were, but perhaps some of them were roofs on schools that should be closed, or maybe even are in their. I guess they wouldn't be in their current proposal of school closings. But Governor Hogan re certainly remembered that, apparently, when uh, the superintendent came before him asking for money for these roof projects, which usually are pretty routine. Um, there's always some roof project going on when you have over 40 schools. And, you know, of course, we're not the largest. I'm sure all the, all the jurisdictions have that. But um, normally that would be a pretty benign meeting with the uh, – the Board of uh, Public Works, so it's pretty interesting uh, that uh, that the governor would um, get angry. So it goes on to say, in a most unusual confrontation between an obviously angry Hogan and a county school superintendent, Guthrie tried to explain the... Um, I'm having trouble reading that word here tried to explain that unless the $4 million offer from the Republican governor was guaranteed to pass through a Democrat-controlled legislature and, um, and would address the needed funding from the Carroll County Board of Commissioners, his hands were tied. Wow, we're coming up on a break again already. I'm going to read the rest of this article and try to get better lighting so I can do a better job. And we'll see what Larry Hogan was upset about. We'll talk to you in five minutes. Join us back here, Liberty Works Radio Network, Carol Confidential. See you in five. Well, welcome back to Liberty Works Radio Network, Carol Confidential. This is Robin Frazier, and I'm uh, on alone. Normally have uh, Commissioner Rothschild here with me. 
And uh, today we talked a little bit about some of the taxes that um, I proposed to reduce when I was commissioner. Impact fees we actually did reduce, um, but it looks like they're back on the table again. Um, if it's for school buildings, I think that's a big mistake, but uh, I can't wait to hear what that's about. I'm going to ask Rich. And the Homestead Tax Credit, which we could have been on top of, and your, as your assessments went up, they would have increased, uh, they would have had a cap of 3% on them instead of 5 would have made it a little bit easier to uh, afford when assessments went up. And, of course, the county wouldn't reduce, you know, its, its rate so that you balanced out there. So going to go up a little bit faster than they would have because they neglected, we, neglect, we couldn't get that third vote, and they neglected to uh, reduce that cap for you. So now um, I was looking at the Northern News and saw this interesting article about how Hogan uh, rejected Guthrie when he came before the uh, Board of Public Works to ask for a little bit of money for roofs. Was again, pretty uh, benign request. You know, all the counties go and 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 kind of beg for the money that they need. And uh, with a Republican governor, you'd think Republican Terrell County would be able to get some money. But what happened was this. I'm going to begin this paragraph again. It says, in a most unusual confrontation between an obviously angry Hogan and a county school superintendent, Guthrie tried to explain that unless the $4 million offer from the Republican governor was guaranteed to pass through the Democrat-controlled legislature, coupled with additional needed funding from the Carroll County Board of Commissioners, his hands were tied. Therefore, he was forced to close the schools after this school season. Hmm. He was forced to do that. I don't know why he's saying that. He, uh, you know, we thought we should be looking at closing schools back in 2010. And actually, when we first came into office and uh, the superintendent thought we were all going to be conservative, uh, he actually had some ideas about what schools might be closed. And uh, they had been thinking about it because they thought we were going to, you know, put the pressure on to do that. As soon as he learned that he pretty much had three votes not to close schools, well, that came off the table pretty quickly. And they've been drifting along, uh, wasting money, um, you know, utilizing facilities in an unwise way, in a way that wastes tax dollars. And you've got 5,000 empty seats. That's a lot. And elementary school is about six. Hundred, you know, um, uh, a middle school might be six to eight hundred. A high school they like to be twelve hundred, but West, Westminster's, you know, two thousand. So five thousand, you know, the couple high schools and 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 a few elementary schools, you know, a worth of children. That's a lot, and so we certainly should should be closing schools. So, again, on this, uh, Hogan had offered $4 million. I think Shoemaker is the one that came up with the idea to try to bridge the gap in what the superintendent said his needs were to, to continue to pay operating costs that we shouldn't be paying. So I personally think that's like flushing money down the toilet. I don't agree with that. But on the other hand, since <laughs> the schools that, that the superintendent is proposing to close – uh, are not going to save taxpayer dollars and are not the wise choices. Um, you know, it'll be all right with me if we delay. But <laughs> either way, uh, the Republican governor uh, didn't forget that he offered that money and the superintendent didn't take it. And, uh, uh, and that's what happened. So Hogan was openly hostile to Guthrie and was incredulous to his explanation. And Guthrie's time at the podium lasted nine minutes before he was summarily dismissed with Hogan saying, at this point, I wouldn't count on the money if I were you. So, what an interesting dilemma to have here in Carroll County, where when we don't sit down and make, have reasonable discussions and reasonable plans, we have a conservative county who ought to be able to uh, get the dollars that we need for the things we really need from a conservative governor, and we're having a fight. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's incredible to me. 
So uh, I'm, in a way, you know, it tickles me that the governor is uh, strong enough to say, look, you know, uh, you need to do a better job. And uh, if you're not going to, you know, do take a a second look at this stuff, then uh, (laughs) no money, buddy. What a shame. What a shame. So um, I'm still going to be trying to uh, give some better ideas of which schools should be closed. Again, uh, we talked about this at length last time, but the schools on uh, the, that are going to be axed are uh, North, um, New Windsor Middle, which doesn't make any sense at all. Pretty new renovation there. Um, you know, it's on the outskirts of Westminster, but if you all you have to do is take that Long Valley, all that development there in the Long Valley area, on the others just on the behind um, Bulger's Restaurant and going running down Route 31. Um, you just send them right down the highway, and they get to New Windsor Middle pretty pretty quickly. And it's a pretty good large chunk of uh, children that are there kind of on the outskirts of Westminster. Um, North Carroll. And um, in the past, I'd said North Carroll was a good idea to close because I'm thinking there's two schools very close to each other and that you probably could divide the, the uh, children pretty well uh, with one of those schools, either Manchester Valley or North Carroll, uh, not in the picture. North Carroll's in a great location for economic development. But when I took a look at someone's idea, which was to put the East and West Middle School, which are aging and, the, and on the um, charts for uh, modernization, looking for money for modernization, which is very expensive, very high capital dollars, and put them in the Winters Mill High School, which is right there in Westminster. So you'd have Westminster students going to a Westminster-located high school. And if you looked at the students that were coming to Winters Mill, a large portion of them are the ones that uh, are in the rural area which could easily be divided. So you take some of those to Manchester Valley, you take some of those Manchester Valley kids probably down to North Carroll or Finksburg up to North Carroll, and it it really actually balances out pretty well. So, um, and then, of course, the elementary school, Charles Carroll, which I've been fighting for for years and which probably would have been closed last time I was uh, in the commissioner's office, but because uh, I opposed it so greatly, and um, Commissioner Rothschild uh, stuck with me on it. Um, It did not close. doesn't make any sense. If you look at the uh, map, it's located in the perfect location, services the right group of, uh, certain group of kids has been doing it for decades. They're in the rural area. It's not planned for growth, you know right size, right place. Kids are doing great. It's a a community draw. It helps the economy there in Silver Run and uh, the Myers District. And uh, the uh, parents there know their school's not modern, and they're okay with it. They should leave them alone. And William Winchester, which was one of the the elementary schools that was uh, suggested in the big expensive study we did, that that elementary school will be the one that makes sense to close right in the Westminster area, surrounded by other Westminster area schools. So it keeps the community together, and it's on a piece of fine commercial property uh, adjacent to the uh, West Middle School. I, I don't know if they're on the same piece of land or just adjacent to each other, but together they're right there on the hill where Monroe comes down to where the Chick-fil-A is and that, that super... Um, that shopping center. So it's um, Bauman's is right at the bottom of the hill there. It's a, it's a prime piece of commercial property. So there's, I think, some wiser things that could be done. And I hope um, that this, in this case, that the state will uh, hold up the um, closing of schools that don't make any sense and we'll be able to do something that's that does make sense for the taxpayer and uh, so that we can get dollars back in the classroom. If we're not spending the operating dollars to operate a a facility that we don't need, then we can put that in the classroom and pay for the teachers that we do need and uh, put it where learning is happening. 
uh, the administration. If we have so many less um, students, probably it's time to get rid of some of those high-paying administrative positions. Uh, there's plenty of room to find those dollars, and I hope the pressure comes on. And uh, and one of the ways for pressure to come is to not fund uh, things that are in that current budget so that they'll be forced to look at where do we really need to cut. And, of course, I think all of the citizens can give them some pretty good ideas on where that might be. Uh, I did notice in the paper while I was uh, looking at that, that article uh, right on the front page. And on the other side is this other article. It says the um, Board of Education term limit hearing on Saturday. It says Delegate Haven Shoemaker will hold a public hearing for proposed legislation to enact term limits for Carroll County School Board members on Saturday at 1.30 p.m. at the Ronald Reagan Room of the Carroll County Office Building in Westminster. Shoemaker hopes to gain feedback from the public as well as local public officials before moving forward with the proposal for the proposed legislation. All involved stakeholders are welcome and encouraged to attend. A two-term limit was proposed, and it says unanimously, when Shoemaker served as a Carroll County Commissioner on the prior board to the current. That is incorrect. I did not vote um, to limit term limits for commissioners, and I'll explain why in a minute. And uh, he served one term, and then he moved on uh, to uh, to run for delegate, which he serves now as a delegate representing District 5. Um, So he did one of his campaign promises was term limits for commissioners, and um, that was passed. Uh, during the time that I was commissioner, but I did vote against it. And I believe (laughs) that um, the people should determine who their representatives are. I believe representatives should be serving the people and that they should not be um, looking uh, at politics as a career but as a time that they set aside where they serve the public. And if we get back to that idea that you're, you're just serving, then, um, you know, you won't, you won't stick in there for year, years and years. However, uh, as a commissioner, if you're doing a great job and uh, it's up to the people to vote you in or vote you out and, you know, why not allow somebody who's doing a good job to continue more than two terms? And I know we, we had just gone through a period of time where we had a commissioner that was in there for a lot of years. Finally, um, you know, Commissioner Googe did enough things that people saw this is not working, and she was, she was soundly voted out of office. Um, I think if we have term limits, especially at the local level, where people, you know, have the opportunity to see their elected officials and voice their concerns and know what's going on, if they'll pay, they don't have to pay too much attention to see what's happening because they're affected pretty directly by the things that the commissioners do. It's up to the people to make the decision. And if we keep making these term limits, uh, decisions, uh, then it lets the, kind of lets the people off the hook. You know, say, well, okay, well, we're stuck with them, but hey, then they won't be able to get back in there the next year. And I really think that if we don't allow the people to, uh, you know, when you, when the righteous rule, the people are happy, and um, and when the evil rule, the people mourn. You know, sometimes you, it's got to hurt before we get the people's attention, but it's still up to the people. And we will not have.